Germany. Yeah, right. I recognize the gentleman uh, from Ohio, Mr. Drehaus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity, and I appreciate all the witnesses being here and, and uh, providing the testimony with regard to how difficult it actually is uh, to pinpoint the numbers uh, of jobs created and the jobs being retained uh, through the efforts of the stimulus package. Um, but certainly we have heard a lot of propaganda. Uh, we've heard propaganda, you know, suggesting that this isn't having any effect, that we are not impacting the economy. Um, it seems crystal clear to me uh, that not only is this having a, a significant effect, and we can argue as to whether or not it's, it's 600,000 jobs, 640,000 jobs, 700,000 jobs in terms of direct benefit. But I'd like to get to a minute um, talking about exactly what it is those jobs are in terms of direct spending, uh, but then also talk about the multiplier effect that we see. Uh, through this investment. So, so the jobs that you're referring to are, are only looking at a small portion, a relatively small portion uh, of the spending itself. Uh, you know, $63.7 billion went into entitlements. Uh, tax relief was another almost third of this. And so this is only looking at a portion of the contracts, grants, and loans, correct? Mr. Dodaro, is that correct? Th that's correct. And so when, when we look at just that portion, and we say, we believe that there are jobs upward of 600,000 that have been created. Um, take, uh, for instance, a, a construction job. And I just brought with me you know, the spending that we've seen in greater Cincinnati, which is now upward of almost $700 million. And, and they describe here uh, a project that will directly employ 75 people in a construction project. Now, I assume that 75 is reported. But the individuals that might be uh, supplying the, the hardware for that job, the, the individuals that might be supplying the lumber for that job, the individuals that, and the companies that are supplying the roofing materials for that job, um, the, the transportation workers that bring the materials to the site, um, the, the uniform manufacturers that make the uniforms that help these people on the job. None of those are being included in, in this direct number, correct? Uh, that's correct. That's correct. The, the indirect uh, costs is, or uh, indirect benefits, rather, as you're talking about all the materials and the supplies and all those things, as well as how much additional spending is then induced, is not covered. It's just focused on the direct jobs that are created. And, and I assume we can use the same line of reasoning if we're talking about a construction project, uh, a road that's being built, and, and the cement manufacturers, or the asphalt manufacturers, the, the designers, the architects, the engineers, all of the professional employees whose work uh, goes into those jobs that are being created. So that's the, the multiplier effect here is that we are paying partial salaries through these, through these contracts to hundreds of thousands of individuals who are participating and supporting these direct jobs that are being created. There are definitely indirect benefits, yes. I, I assume, Mr. Miller, that the same goes for education, that when we talk about uh, retaining hundreds of thousands of jobs of teachers, that those teachers go out to the grocery store and buy groceries. I assume that those same teachers also buy clothing uh, for their children and for their families. Uh, I assume that those teachers also drive automobiles and, and buy gas for those automobiles. I assume they also use electricity and use energy. I assume that the salaries uh, that are going into those teachers and, and supporting the families of those teachers through that spending is going to create and support jobs across the economy. Is that correct? No, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and I would also say that we've seen other uses of funds, for example, in rural communities where the districts have bought laptops for students, have put smart boards, electronic devices to help accelerate and improve learning and, and allow them to develop skills, that the jobs associated with the producers of those smart boards, the training that's been provided to teachers, is also not reflected in the over 300,000 job numbers that we've reported. So then, well, while you're reporting that several hundred thousand jobs have been retained uh, in terms of teachers, is, is it fair to say that that, that same uh, direct creation of jobs, we would see the inverse were that investment not made, so that we wouldn't see uh, the 300,000 jobs or so that have been created uh, for teachers, but we also would not see the ripple effect in the economy uh, of that investment going into those teachers? Yes. 
I think uh, looking at notices that were literally picked up, that were announced and then later rescinded because of the receipt of stimulus monies, we're confident that hundreds of thousands of teachers and educator related jobs would have been not saved had it been not for this money. Moreover, the impact that would have had on education and students in their learning and the, frankly, the compromise that would have been to the long term growth because we need to have a student population that is prepared to compete, we think would also be at risk. So we actually see the impact. Uh, outside of the direct uh, contracts that, that you're reporting on, uh, do you also believe, Mr. Dodaro, that the Medicaid transfer payments, uh, for example, are, are critically important uh, to supporting the health care industry and long-term care, uh, I, I assume nursing homes, I assume uh, assisted living providers, uh, medical device manufacturers, uh, doctors, uh, nurses, uh, physician aides, all of these individuals who work in the health care field, uh, do you believe that, that their jobs are being supported or retained due to the direct investment made by the Medicaid? transfer payments? As we've reported in the past upon the use of the monies by selected states and localities, the Medicaid uh, additional federal matching share has had at least two, two effects. One, it's helped support the increased number of people on the Medicaid rolls as a result of unemployment and allowed the, the states to maintain uh, eligibility requirements for Medicaid. So it's helped achieve one of the other objectives of the act, in addition to jobs created and retained, was to help those affected by the recession. It's also helped achieve another one of the goals of the act, which is to stabilize state and local government budgets. And the increased federal share meant that some of the state share could be reduced, particularly in those states with high unemployment because they got additional Medicaid funding uh, based upon the unemployment rates. So that allowed them to then use that state money for other purposes as well. Gentlemen, time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Devaney, um, in your response to the ranking member's letter, you said there's no way to really audit or certify that the 640,000 jobs number <laughs> is is, is accurate. Earlier you also said that the data, the, the information, the numbers you get comes directly from the recipients. But isn't it true it first goes to the state and then to OMB and then to you guys? I mean, there's, is, it, is it three, this information, the recipients are getting the dollars, send it to the state, send it to OMB, and then you get the information? Actually, uh, Congressman, it, it goes from recipients sometimes to states. In 31 states, the states collected that information and sent it in. In other states, it, we got information directly from the recipients. But it comes to something called federalreporting.gov, which we built and owned and maintained the integrity so of. So in some cases, it comes directly to you, not through OMB? That's true. The, the, the recipients are, for the most part, reporting directly to federalreporting.gov. In 31 states, though, there's at least some intermediate step. So there's a couple bites at the apple before this information goes public. Is that right? In, in 31 states, and, and the states did this differently, all states did it differently, but in some of those 31 states, Who made, there was a quality review that, of the, that the data 12, before it was The 12 sent. projects, 12 programs that were left off. Uh, that were not reported because someone made a determination that there was so much ridiculous information there that they shouldn't be public. Right. Who made that decision? You guys or someone else? Uh, OMB asked us to look at it, and we concurred. So that in that case, it went to OMB before it went to you? No, it, no, sir. It was in the database, and OMB had access to the database along with the So agencies. who makes the call? That's the, that, so now we're back to the OMB doing it. Who's, who's actually making the call on when this stuff goes public? Well, at the and end how of the it, how it's displayed, how it's reported? At the end of the day, the board makes the call as to whether or not there was significant error in those in that data, and it would have caused public confusion. Okay, did the board make the call on these 12, or did OMB make the call? We both made the call. Well, which is it? When you said the board makes the call, now you're saying both the made OMB the call. The OMB asked us to look at it. We concurred with their assessment that there was a lot going on with those 12, including 60,000 jobs that absolutely did not look right. Okay, the is there any, uh, change a little direction, is there any penalty for people who provide you with false, misleading, or ridiculous information? Any penalty, like, in other words, if, if we're getting ridiculous information, these folks should be, the money that was spent, if we can get some of it back, is there some kind of penalty for that? No, there isn't. No penalty? No. Do you find that strange? I mean, th think about this. Think, put it in context. Put it in the, the way the American people see it. We've got a health care bill moving through the House, moving through the Congress, which says if you don't buy health care, you can go to jail. And now people are, 
getting taxpayer dollars, giving ridiculous information, 12 projects that, that are so ridiculous you don't even list it, and there's no penalty for that? How are we going to correct that matter? Well, I, as I said earlier in my testimony this morning, I'm, I'm a big advocate for having penalties, but the Congress didn't put any penalties in. You'd be in favor of strong penalties for I would people be. who, who I would take be. taxpayer dollars and report crazy information. No, I'd be I'd be in, I'd be interested in certainly penalties for people who didn't report, and I would be equally interested in in looking at the issue of what happens when people knowingly false report. Okay. I think that could be a, pe a criminal penalty. Mr. Dodaro, you you you've had several years. How many years have you had experience with uh, the the General Accounting Office? Uh, 36 years. 36 years. In 36 years of serving uh, in that, uh, that part of our government, um, do you ever recall a time where we had this term created or saved? In other words, is this the first time this past year where we've used this kind of uh, sort of measurement, if you can even use that term with it, uh, is this the first time in the 36 years you've been looking at what the government does and accounting for how it spends taxpayer dollars? Is the first time we've ever had that term? Well, it, it definitely, the whole issue of tracking the cr creation of jobs has always been a difficult methodological My challenge. question was real straightforward. I, I understand what Created your question Created or is. saved. Is this I, the first time in 36 years your experience in government that you know of right. that we've ever had that term used as some, at least what some would call some kind of measurement? Now, uh, based upon my immediate recollection, I can't, I can't recall. Do you think that's a little I, strange I, I just, that we have this new term? Well, it definitely is something that uh, given the context of what the uh, act was trying to achieve with its multiple objectives, I don't think is, t is unreasonable. It's anyone, difficult, anyone it's else difficult our, to measure. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel uh, recall any time prior, prior to this year we've ever had this, this quote measurement created or saved? I'll take that as a, as, as a no. Uh, last question I would have for our, our panel, I'll start with uh, the sec uh, de Deputy Secretary from Transportation. What kind of contact do you have in a, on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis with, uh, with the administration, in particular Mr. Biden, who's a, whose responsibility it was to make sure we got this, this information in an accurate way? Do, do, you have a, do you have weekly meetings, or what kind of contact do you normally have? We, we uh, have uh, a number of contacts and, and uh, virtually daily interactions, twice weekly calls. Uh, regular uh, uh, meetings, uh, and uh, the the common theme uh, is making sure that we're getting these projects out there, making sure that do, we're do you have what kind of contact? My question was, what kind of contact do you have with with the vice president, with with the, the office of the White House or the vice president? The vice president uh, leads periodic meetings uh, that include all the departments on this topic. If I could, Mr. Chairman, one last question for Mr. Devaney: Do you have any contact at all with the administration on a on a regular basis, or with the uh, or with the White House, or is it strictly with OMB? Uh, I do. I do see the vice president from time to time. Uh, probably average uh, once a month. Did the vice president weigh in at all? If I could, Mr. Chairman, on the, the keeping the twelve off the list, did he weigh in on that decision? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. Thank you. Thank you, gentleman from Ohio. I now yield to the gentleman from gentleman from Vermont. Yeah, Mr. Welch. Good afternoon. <laughs> I want to thank uh, you gentlemen for being here. You have, you have an incredibly important job. It's about uh, accounting for uh, the enormous amount of taxpayer money that has been invested in the stimulus program. And uh, you're doing a good job. And the reason you're doing a good job is all we want are the facts. Uh, we're not, it's Congress that authorized this program. Uh, the only thing you're being asked to do is report on how it's working. Uh, you're being asked to report on whether the money has gone missing, uh, and you're doing it. And I know that uh, on our side of the aisle, and I expect on the other side of the aisle, the goal here is for us to get information as opposed to make political speeches. Uh, but we <laughs> we've heard quite a few political speeches, and frankly, uh, it, that's distressing to me, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we've got to rebuild America. And we know how we got to where we are at. We had a, a private sector financial system led by our big banks on Wall Street that completely disregarded the public trust that they have and nearly destroyed our economy. And it was so bad that one of the most conservative presidents uh, in my lifetime uh, came to Congress with the, former, with the Secretary of Treasury, uh, the former chair of one of our major investment banking houses, 
and said that if Congress did not approve a $750 billion bailout over the weekend, then the economy as we knew it would be destroyed. Uh, I'm just reciting that because it gives us some perspective of why we find ourselves uh, in the situation that we're in. The private sector financial system put a gun to the head of the American economy, and they pulled the trigger. Uh, step one was to stabilize the financial system. I was one of the members of Congress who had no desire whatsoever to vote for that legislation to take $750 billion of taxpayer dollars and stabilize a financial system that had inflicted uh, a self-inflicted wound. But it did its damage. And when the economy went off the cliff about a year ago, we started seeing the unemployment rate skyrocket. And we saw hardworking Americans lose their jobs through no fault of their own. And that unemployment rate is continuing to rise as we speak. And President Obama uh, came forward with a proposal on a stimulus package. Uh, and that, by the way, was endorsed, as you know, by Republican and Democratic economists. There was no dispute, uh, except on the extreme edges, as to whether or not in this dire situation, the federal government had to be the spender of last resort. Again, not anything any of us wanted to do, uh, but something that was a broad consensus position had to be done. It had to be done so we could fight another day, not so that we, not because we wanted to do it. And in the doing of it, the stimulus, there was a commitment that was made by Congress, and I think shared Republicans and Democrats, whether you voted for it or not, that the money should go to jobs, that it should be accounted for. It shouldn't be distributed on the basis of political party or affiliation. It should be broadly beneficial to America. Now, <clears throat> taking a look at how it works, that's a fair and square, uh, fair and square question. Uh, and there was a lot of debate in Congress about how much of the stimulus should be allocated to tax cuts, how much for infrastructure. In the House, and I was among those who believed the more for infrastructure, the better, because it would create more jobs than the tax cuts. There was a big debate about whether we should use stimulus money to go back to the states to help maintain our teachers, our firefighters, and our police, and maintain and preserve those jobs. And I haven't heard any acknowledgment in the speeches here that this has been a lifeline. The stimulus has been a lifeline for our states, and I can speak for Vermont. Uh, we would have had a catastrophe in Vermont uh, that if we had not had the stimulus funds. Even with the stimulus funds, Vermont, with a Democratic legislature and a Republican governor, had to work together very hard to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to pass a budget. <clears throat> and we, we are continuing to experience a lot of pain. So uh, it's not my custom generally to make speeches, but apparently uh, today's <laughs> hearing is much about that. And the point I want to make is two. Number one, uh, I believe that the challenge for this Congress uh, is to do things that are going to help build up America, find ways where we can work together. And this stimulus is a necessary step that we took in order to maintain credibility. We've got to make sure that it's transparent and that we can account for what has been spent and how effectively it's been spent. Those are just factual questions, just the facts, ma'am. Mr. Devaney, if you have uh, suggestions about penalties, you know, let's give them to us and we can vote on them. But I hope it's specific. I encourage you to continue doing the great work that you're doing, and I encourage our members, uh, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> to focus on getting America back on its feet. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. And now you have five minutes to the <coughs> gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your work and, and, and your being here. Uh, uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, when, following up on Mr. Jordan's question, when is the last time you personally spoke with the Vice President, Vice President Biden? I believe it was, um, may have been last week. Um, is there a master list of who is supposed to get the stimulus money? Do you have like a master list? Here's who's supposed to get the money. I don't have that. That's just mind-boggling to me that we don't have a list of even who is supposed to get the money. I think I, it's, I, Congressman, I think it's fair to say that each of the 28 agencies that oversee the recovery money have such a list. Um, and, and they're in the process right now of trying to determine whether or not each and every one of the, of the recipients on that list actually reported. And I hope to get that result soon. It, it seems like a, a simple 
uh, basic accounting uh, process to understand. It, what it highlights is we don't know what we don't know. And that to me is a very scary proposition in, in moving forward. In my own state of Utah, uh, Representative uh, Bishop, one of my colleagues, uh, has, has pointed out there was some $1.2 million that went to the 4th Congressional District of Utah. We only have three congressional districts. There was uh, $529,834 that went to the 00, zero District, Congressional District of, of Utah. I simply do not understand how those very basic things can happen and puts to me the entire reporting uh, into question. Now suddenly you go to the website and it says, well, they're not accounted for, they're, you know, it's unattributed. Uh, how are we going to resolve this? Well, we don't uh, know. We don't even know who's supposed to get the money. Then when we say where it went to, it's going to congressional districts that don't even exist. Well, Congressman, I think first and foremost, the recipients in Utah put the wrong zip, put the wrong congressional district in. They're the ones that entered that data. Now, uh, going forward, I think we can put technology in the system that says something like, if you're in a state with only one district. You can't put anything other than that district in there. If you're in a, if you're, if you enter a nine-digit zip code, it has to correspond and match the uh, congressional district. So uh, I think uh, going forward, we can eliminate that. I, it, it, our time is so short. If we could follow up with the additional procedures, I would sincerely appreciate it. Um, my understanding from your testimony is that there have been some 340 complaints. There are 77 uh, investigations open and more than 390 audits. Can you help explain that, those numbers to me, please? Uh, of course. The, um, the and how many people do you have dedicated to perform those functions? Uh, the, the actual board has, has a limited number, maybe perhaps a dozen people that work in that area. But we, we leverage the resources of the 29 inspector generals okay. that, that oversee the money. So some of those complaints are coming in on our, on our hotline since the data has been released some 350 plus, and some of them came in before the data was released and directly to inspector generals. So out of all the complaints we've had come in, 77 investigations have been opened and 390 okay. or so. And again, we'll, we'll follow up with some additional details, but that does help, help clarify. Mr. Miller, I, I'm having read through your testimony and, and heard what you had to say. At the top of at least the printed out portion here of, of page five, it says, we had accounted for 97 percent of our Recovery Act obligations to date. What does that mean for the other three percent that you just, there's no, what does that mean? No, it means the, the bulk of our money is formula money and our large state fiscal stabilization that flows through states. In particular, there's two programs, Impact Aid and Federal Work Study, which goes directly, again, Work Study being, goes to individual students on part-time programs through colleges and universities. Given the very distributed nature of that, some of those recipients, colleges and universities, had difficulty understanding. But that represents such a small percentage that, but specifically to answer percentage your question, might, it would be the might federal work study. You might think it's case. small, but it represents $2 billion. What I just want to make sure we understand is how we're going to account for what is unaccounted now. $2 billion worth of, uh, of dollars. And, and I'd just like to follow up with you. I see my time is, is, is ending here. Let me ask uh, one more question of you, Mr. Miller. It says in your testimony, a total of 742 reports out of 2,229 were changed during this recent agency review period. There's concerns on many fronts that literally about a third of these reports had to be changed. Either the information that they're getting and the system and the process they have to go to is terribly flawed, or there is fraud going. I, I mean, it's just such a staggeringly high number to have uh, to go back and change literally a third of the reports that are coming in. I, well, just I think with the unprecedented transparency, what you find is a change would be we did have the incorrect Treasury code. We had the incorrect DUNS number. These were technical changes in terms of to be consistent with transparencies. These were not, in fact, changes to the jobs being reported. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a very crucial hearing. The timing of it is uh, great. And uh, I'm so glad to see Secretary Miller from my district, LA Unified, as our Deputy Secretary of Education. So uh, 
and he knows the condition of our state and our tremendous uh, shortfall. So given the economic crisis uh, in the state of California, I was especially glad to see that my school district, the Los Angeles Unified School District, was the third largest recipient of Recovery Act funds in the state. And can you explain the impact these funds are having on the quality of education we're able to provide for our youth? And I do know that we have a serious shortfall in our budget in LA Unified. Yeah, I, and I think LA Unified, being the second largest school district in the country, um, is a great story in terms of the impact. I know uh, from the press that there were thousands of jobs uh, that were at risk that the superintendent was desperately trying to address given the state's budget shortfall and that the receipt of the stimulus money um, allowed, in this case, particularly thousands of pink slips to be picked up um, and so that the school year for the 09-10 school year, in fact, could be preserved and, and have more integrity. And I think in a, in a large urban school district, which has substantial student achievement issues in terms of the gap between those of high poverty and low poverty, that the, the need to maintain class sizes and not have them skyrocket, the need to ensure that you have the latest equipment is, is paramount if we ever are going to close the achievement gap. And I think uh, the stimulus money is very much have, have helped us make progress and prevent us from, from falling back. Uh, we could use another trance, couldn't we? <laughs> because even with the monies that have been received, there is not enough there to close the gap. And I've heard the superintendent just the beginning of this week talking about the layoffs, uh, shortened school weeks, uh, time off at no pay, and so on. Because I believe we're almost up to a million students. Uh, I understand before I got to the committee meeting that uh, there were some challenges to the data and talking about propaganda. But I wish we would remind ourselves the mistaken war we fought in Iraq, costing us $15 billion a month. And now they're asking for more troops in Afghanistan, which will cost us $5 billion a month. And if we could get just a portion of that to improve our education system, to improve our transportation system, we could do wonders in strengthening the education of our youth. I just attended a uh, high-tech uh, meeting early this morning, and I mentioned to them around the table that we're going to do the best we can in educating our children in sciences and math so we can be competitive. And uh, I take India. You know, with their large $1.1 billion, they test their kids and they send the most talented ones to a certain school. So I am hoping that we can stimulate, particularly in the educational field, and I want to get uh, Mr. Dodaro to comment on this, but I hope that we can send monies out to our educational institutions, our school boards, directly so that we can support their curriculum and particularly in higher education. You know, we're turning away students from our community colleges. And so those who are saying that the figures are propaganda, I can say come to my district, our unemployment has always been over two digits. And if we have a national unemployment of 10.2%, Ours would be close to 11. Mr. Dodaro, in your overseeing, are you satisfied with the information you're getting about how we have used that stimulus money? And are we seeing jobs created? Can we look to the future with the stimulus? And if we have a second one, if we can indeed create jobs so that we can enhance school boards uh, throughout this nation, not just in mine, but throughout the nation. Can you respond? Yes, on, on your uh, first point, I thought that the, the national data collection system that was set up was a good first step, but there are a number of data quality and reporting issues that are significant and need to be addressed to improve the quality of the information and the accuracy 
and completeness of it. So that's a challenge. We've made some recommendations. OMB's agreed to implement those recommendations. The extent to which they're implemented will increase the quality of the information. Now, with regard to future stimulus, one of the other mandates we have under the current bill, the Recovery Act, is to look at the impact of economic downturns on state governments and what, what effects it has on them, on health care, and other important areas like education. So I think, you know, we will be examining that. Uh, it asks us to go back to the 1974-75 recession and look historically, including the latest economic downturn. One of the areas I think is very important is the future targeting of assistance, whether it's based on unemployment levels or other factors. There was some targeting in this uh, stimulus bill in the Medicaid area, but in other areas, I think that's something that could be looked to to perhaps be improved in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlewoman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Gao. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and um, I'm not interested in whether or not the stimulus bill is right or wrong. What I'm interested in is just plain number crunching. Um, now, Mr. Miller, based on your testimony, you said that $67 billion have been spent uh, through the Department of Education, and from the $67 billion, uh, approximately 400,000 jobs have been created or saved. Um, my question to you is, of the 300,000 educators, what is their average salary? Uh, as, as we look at the calculation, it would be roughly represent uh, a dollars per job saved, of roughly about, I believe, 105,000 which when we actually look at No, my question to you is, what is the average salary of, a, of an educator? Now, on a fully loaded basis, it's about $70,000, so which would be 70% of a dollar. Per, on, on the average per educator. On a fully loaded basis. And so that's why when we, actually, when we actually look at the total job saved in the context of awards to date, we triangulate and say, for $100,000, if typically 70% is personnel cost, I'm sorry, the number seems to. Of the uh, 100,000 dollars, uh, 100,000 jobs that are remaining, what kind of jobs are they? Excuse me? Of the you say that there are 300,000 uh, the, jobs. These would be, with the, uh, they'll call, we call government services. Many of them are government services because and 18 percent of the average salary for those positions? Uh, I don't believe I have that information, but I can get that information to you. Would it be safe to say $50,000 per job? Again, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate, I'd hate to speculate. Now, based on my own uh, number crunching, uh, if you take $67 billion and divide it by 400,000 jobs, you, the number comes out to be about $167,000 per job. Now, if, if, a, if, a, if an average educator makes about $70,000, my question to you here is, where did the other $100,000 go? I'm sorry. Where, where did the other 100,000 jobs? Uh, no, where did the other $100,000 go? If, if, if an average educator makes $70,000 per year, based on your numbers, my calculation comes out to be about $167,000 per job. So but my that question be, that to you be, is, if we... For every dollar, for every dollar invested, 70% of it goes to personnel. So what you would take is, you would, you would only expect... Seven cents on right, seven seventy cents on the dollar to be for personnel costs. You'd have the whole. So, so, so if if seventy percent goes to personnel costs, the other thirty percent goes to capital, computers, all the things that you would need to support. So there's a notion of you need office, you need all on a fully loaded basis beyond just benefits. You have personal salary. So, so basic, basically, mm -hmm. based on your own testimony, the numbers don't come out correctly. No, the, if, the opposite. If I you think have we triangulated, we were confident that they actually coming top down that it actually matched. Sir, if you have 77 cents out of every dollar goes into personnel, in other words, go into the actual job safe or create, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Which according to, uh, so based on, uh, based on your calculation, then 70% of $167,000 would be approximately $140,000. No, we're talking about the education related jobs. So part of this is understanding which math we're talking about. If you take the 325,000 educator-related jobs, if you actually looked at the average education job per salary, then you would say it's roughly just over $100,000. If you said 70% of that, typically, if you look at the allocation of education budgets, 70% of educators' 
of, of, of the educational spend is personnel on a fully loaded basis. You would say roughly the math top Ms. down. Ms. Ms. Mr. Miller, mm -hmm. I've taught middle school. I've taught at the college level also. When I taught middle school, you know what, what my salary was? 20000 per year. When I taught at the college level, do you, do you know what my salary was? $28,000 per year. Now, my question, now, I, I, I am a little bit confused with respect to how you arrive at this $100,000 per educational job, because I know for a fact that teachers don't make $100,000 a year. All of the teachers in my district, if they're lucky, if they have a 20 or a 30 year experience, they'll be lucky to make 60 or $70,000 per year. So my question to you here is, based on your numbers, it would cost $167,000 per job if an average educator makes $67,000 per year. Where did that, where did that $100,000 remaining go? Where did that $100,000 go? Again, if I could try to clarify. I believe, and I can follow up the details, the average salary based on the National Center of Educational Sciences is roughly $50,000. If you actually look at so the where benefits, did the other $127, you at, then go. once you load for benefits, it's roughly 24%. When you then, that, that's how you get to the just under 70% of personnel-related cost for an education. And that's, again, based my on national statistics. My question to you here is, if my, if my constituents were, were to ask me, how did you spend this money, I have to tell them that, well, of $167,000 that went into an educational job, 50000 went to an educator, and I don't really know where the, 100, where the other $120,000 go. Again, you have to, if you, if you could appreciate, I'm, I've spent the bulk of my professional career both in private equity and as an operating executive, and like you, very familiar with finance. I think one of the first things we did as we tried to scrub the numbers was to ensure that the math you did tried to add scrub up. The, the gentleman's time has expired, <laughs> and let me Thank just you, take Mr. him Chairman. on the way to recognize him, Mr. Clay. You should have been teaching in New York or California. You would have made some money. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. The question, Clay. the word is that we wanted to teach. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank, uh, thank the panel for being here. Let me start the question with uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Pokari. Uh, transportation jobs allow for the awarding of contracts, uh, loans, grants, and the creation of, of projects all around the country. Uh, what is being done to ensure that of the 46,000 jobs reported to be created or saved by the Recovery Act, a fair proportion are going to women and minority employees. Uh, Congressman, it's, a, it's an excellent question. First, uh, none of the uh, normal requirements, including uh, disadvantaged business enterprise uh, goals, were waived as part of the Recovery Act. So we started uh, with the premise that in all the transportation projects, highway, transit, aviation, uh, that, that those requirements apply. Our recipients uh, are required to certify that they ha are uh, actually doing that. We have been working in addition directly with the state DOTs uh, and um, uh, transit agencies, among others, uh, to make sure that that's uh, the case. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, we focused on getting the projects underway quickly uh, and making sure that it's equitable at, uh, at the same time. You know, uh, many of the nation's transportation projects are less than or just more than 50% um, complete. Uh, can you project future job numbers based on the reports you have received thus far? Uh, Congressman, I'm reluctant to, to project into the future on job numbers because, uh, first of all, it's not linear. It's uh, partly dependent on season uh, in many parts of the country. Uh, the weather weather dependency is is a, a big part of that. Um, we we also know that um, the uh, uh, the actual outlays that we have lag the work. The work gets done uh, under uh, local funding, and we reimburse at the end. Um, so uh, on the employment side, um, it, it's it's not uh, linear. But we know that we have uh, many additional created and saved jobs to come. We also have uh, uh, portions of our transportation dollars, uh, including the high-speed rail 
uh, program at $8 billion and the Tiger grants at $1.5 billion that have not yet been awarded. So uh, th those will come as well. Uh, we were trying to get projects out the door quickly. I think we were largely successful in that. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that there's a steady flow of projects around the country uh, throughout the entire uh, time period of the Recovery Act. And uh, we will be successful at that as well. Thank you for that response, Mr. Secretary. And um, I will not bring up the rescission issue. I know that's a separate hearing for us. Let me go to Secretary Miller next. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in your report, it shows that some of the greatest successes of the Recovery Act have occurred in school districts uh, by saving or creating 325,000 uh, education jobs for teachers and personnel. Uh, in my state of Missouri, an estimated 8,500 teachers have been saved from dismissal. Uh, can you discuss what the short and long-term impact on our children and their schools would have, would have been without uh, the Recovery Act education funds? Well, yeah, I, I think as we've traveled around the country and talked firsthand to superintendents, to principals and to teachers whose jobs literally were saved by the Recovery Act. Um, what they tell us uh, and what parents tell us if, is we could not afford to have those teachers not in the classroom at this critical time. And that without those jobs, I, our children's ability to continue learn and to be more college and career ready at a time when it is so important that our high school graduates are prepared to go on to college and to go on to careers in an increasingly competitive world where more jobs are being competed in India and China. And as they make investments in their education system, that this is a critical time that we must sustain and enhance our investment in education. And so they're very thankful and they feel that if this money hadn't been there, those jobs would not have been there and their children would have suffered. Thank you for your response. And real quickly, uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, given your experiences in government, are you aware of any other efforts to collect data and publicly provide information on programs uh, that is similar in scope to recovery.gov? No, sir. Are you aware of any similar website or tracking mechanism uh, in the history of the federal government aimed at providing this level of transparency on government spending? No, sir. Okay, very good. And uh, Madam Chair, I am through with my questions and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Clay. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I spent 18 years in local government filling out reports and uh, applications to the federal government. So this process is uh, very interesting to say the least. <clears throat> starting, I guess, in 1976 before Jimmy Carter was elected, so I sort of date myself. Uh, who decided what questions were going to be included in this survey? Uh, who decided what, que what questions, Which questions were going to be in this reporting process? Uh, that would be OMB. OMB. Right. Why in the world would a congressional seat be included in a report of this type? I actually believe, sir, if my memory serves me right, that's embedded in the act, in the law itself, that the recipients were supposed to report that. So OMB put out the guidance that they had to. So the act was actually engineered to specifically identify political subdivisions within the federal government rather than using the traditional what we have used for 30, 40 years, and that is using the zip code. Uh, zip codes are included as well, but the, it is in the act that congressional districts will be uh, reported. So the act we passed literally had this political element mandated into it. It did. I guess it sort of indicates author intent when you see that kind of thing. I, does. In your experience, do you remember any identifications like this before rather than just using the zip codes and extrapolating that item out? Off the top of my head, I don't. Yeah. I mean, this problem could have been avoided if the, if the act itself hadn't included this political element and just stuck to the traditional zip code um, reporting. In this reporting, by using the, 
the uh, districts. What if you had a situation like the improvement of the rideshare lane on I-15 in San Diego County that goes through Mr. Hunter's, Mr. Isa's, and my district? Does that count as three jobs? Well, they're going to do it if they don't do it. Like me. Uh, no. Uh, I think that, that, that each of the, um, if, if it was a company, let's say it was a contractor that was building that, uh, that contractor as a vendor would report to the state that they were building a highway and they would count the jobs no matter what state or what district they were in. So uh, you're going to get you're going to get a lot of <coughs> projects that span multiple districts and states. Okay. The um, <coughs> transportation situation. Uh, as we're set throwing this money or sending this money out <clears throat> to build projects, has there been any discussion at all, seeing that we took an extraordinary effort and did an emergency uh, push to get that money out there? Has there been any backup push on the regulatory issues that you're, you'll face? And a good example is I was on, on the board that built the light rail system for, for San Diego. Um, the environmental obstructionism of trying to use an existing rail technically is there, but you and I know logically it's absurd. You know, if you're going to improve rail on a site that's been used for 200 years, there's not the issues that environmentally out there. Has there been any discussion at all in your department at coming back and getting us to fast track the regulatory process to allow the projects like the high speed rail in California to be able to move forward and spend the money on construction rather than litigation? Congressman, there's been a, a lot of discussion about various ways to streamline the process, whether it's uh, our internal working group on the new starts uh, uh, transit streamlining process uh, or in more general terms. What you'll find with many of the transportation recovery projects uh, is uh, states uh, and uh, authorities, uh, aviation and transit, put an emphasis on uh, ready-to-go, off-the-shelf projects that have been through those approval processes so that they could get underway quickly and the jobs would be either saved or created quickly. Uh, that's the bulk of what you see around uh, the nation in the projects that are underway. Uh, the transportation projects uh, that are imminent uh, tend to be the larger, more complex ones uh, that needed either some uh, uh, final approvals or were finishing design. Well, and I, we can go through the issue of what we see around too is all the advertising signs that were mandated and then the mandate was withdrawn and the flexibility of, um, of you know, costs be going from 3,000 in one state to 500 in the other. Um, but this whole process being engineered from the beginning with a political statement engineered into the accounting process. I mean, this kind of accounting where you exaggerate the benefits, you underestimate the, the problems, um, is exactly how Enron got itself in trouble and ended up in jail. And as public agencies, we damn them for doing that. And this accounting process seems to be reflecting the Enron is, approach. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Is up. Thank you, Mr. Bilbrey. Um, Secretary Miller, um, your uh, department announced uh, 350,000, uh, 325,000, I'm told, education jobs uh, a few weeks ago. How confident are you, given all we've heard uh, today in this hearing, in those jobs and that we will not find the same problems as to those jobs? Yeah. Uh, we as a department are confident that, that 300,000 plus jobs, educator jobs, have been saved. Uh, on what basis, sir? Um, excuse me? On, on the basis, uh, I think of a, a variety of things that give us that confidence. One, our actual guidance that we invested heavily in was really meant to get at the core issue of not just monies allocated, but specifically, if I just to quote the guidance, uh, a job retained is an existing position that would not have been continued to be filled were it not for Recovery Act funding. So the intent and the guidance that we invested in was, in fact, to get at this core issue, not some clever accounting for monies allocated, but the core issue of did this money. So our investment in the guidance would be one. Two, uh, while it may have been confusing, we actually looked at state budgets, the portion of state's budgets that in fact were addressed by the stimulus monies as reported by the states. We then did the calculations of the, the jobs that were reported by the states in aggregate, looked at what that would have translated to on a per, per, per job basis 
understood what, how did that compare with historical trends, and that was another way that we could triangulate it on it. Third, we actually, independent of the reporting period, since, since the Recovery Act monies were first started being available last April, there have been well over 1,000 news stories, independent news stories, talking and citing specific jobs saved, gave us confidence that the numbers that are being reported are accurate. As we scrubbed, and we have the, the process that, uh, in terms of data quality, we had automatic programs that actually looked at re recipient reporting, where there were outliers, flagged outliers, contacted all 50 states that says, in aggregate, we are confident in them. Because you know that's going to be, <laughs> and those words are going to be quoted back to you. So that's why I, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you think that, that there's any pullback uh, that should go on the record, you need to, to do it because that's a very specific number and a very vital. Uh, no, I, and, I, and I think I understand. I think the question becomes um, with 14,000 school districts, with 100,000 schools, as you then get to the precision of school A versus school B, Right? And, and we don't have access in that level of transparency. So at, do, I, do I, if you would say, do I expect at that level that, that will these numbers be fine-tuned mm -hmm. from school A to school B, from district A to district B? I actually think we will see adjustments made over the course of the next quarter. Yeah. But again, I think in aggregate, as this gets rebalanced and fine-tuned, do we think we will still be coming right back to job save numbers, order of magnitude in the 325,000? I think the answer is yes. Well, I, 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 actually, I appreciate what, what we're trying to do for the first time ever here. Um, we probably need to be operating in the plus or minuses or uh, in, in some kind of range, uh, given the many levels of government with which we are dealing. We would have even tried to do this kind of thing before. Uh, I think the problem may have much to do with the expectation that here's a number and nothing is more specific uh, and finite as a number. So if I got a number, I got the goods on you. As far as we're concerned, uh, or at least uh, speaking for myself, uh, the most important thing is the transparency here, tracking these numbers, correcting these errors. Let me ask you a question in that regard. Given human fallibility, even if all of this data were at one level, um, there, there is, uh, there has been established by OMB a, a way to do quality reviews. So that here you've got something very specific between the 22nd day and the 29th day, it seems, uh, during, um, following the end of each quarter. Uh, there is supposed to be a review. And uh, this review is apparently intended to resolve just such material omissions and reporting errors uh, as have been under discussion at, at these hearing, at, at this hearing today. Uh, if these reviews were conducted and if a material omission or significant reporting error was discovered, was there an immediate process for correcting it? Were people just so quick to just get on to the next step to report the data? Uh, if you had a quality review period, uh, why didn't that period work better? Um, uh, that, can I, that I, I can ask uh, uh, Secretary Miller, Pricari, um e either of you might be the yeah, yeah. Or, or Mr. Chairman Devaney. If yeah. I could take a stab at that. I think um, I think this was the very first time that so much data had been asked to be reported by recipients. It's also the very first time that agencies had to oversee that kind of an activity. They had to report by the well, wait, it was 10 days an adequate time? Well, you, you gave 10 a, days. Um, uh, is seven days, for that matter, enough time for federal agencies to review the information? Well, it, I, at the end of the day, I don't think it is. I, I think that. Are you considering what time period, given the experience you now have? I think given the experience we've had now, I think we are. We are seriously considering trying to think of a way to extend the period of time in which corrections can be made. 
Well, at this point, I think uh, e since, since even the smallest error will be held against you, no matter how many jobs you provide, it, it probably would be better uh, to, to, to engage in some delay. There are a whole lot of us here uh, in, on, on this panel who are, who are more interested in jobs created, recognizing that the United States has never undertaken uh, quite the um, logarithm you have, how much were created, how much would have been created anyway. You can always come back saying they would have been created anyway, but you can't. Not in this recession, we believe. Uh, the economists may need to get to work on their models, by the way, uh, about how many jobs do you create on your own <laughs> in a recession. Okay, uh, 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 locality, you're in the deepest recession uh, ever. Leave out the word depression. The deepest recession ever. There must be a model somewhere that tells me in the, in the midst of um, uh, localities laying off everybody they can find, even after they get stimulus money, there must be a model that says uh, jobs get created uh, and the kinds of jobs that get created. And we see people, for example, in the District of Columbia dismissed uh, after school starts. School uh, has started and teachers dismissed. Then uh, we know for sure this is not a very exact science and whatever models we're using uh, have not had to confront uh, this situation before. But frankly, I've been very impressed by all the overlapping um, accountability. And given that overlapping accountability why it not, did not work, I'm looking at um, um, the recovery board. Then we have the IGs. And we have the state auditors. And we have the prime recipients. And then uh, all this gets publicized through recovery.gov between OMB and the recovery board. Now, the first thing that occurred to me is if all these actors are involved, surely they're not stumbling all over one another. Uh, forgive me if, if it, it, it seems to me that maybe this comes out of my background of dealing with appeals. If one dealt sequentially so that one finds errors in the prior, um, prior level, for example, I can understand that. But what I need to understand here is how these layers either get coordinated, uh, whether they have specific roles, the IG, the, the recovery board, the, 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 the the people responsible within the states, the recipients themselves, have they been given any guidance uh, that would sort them out so that they might be a check one on another? Or are they all trying to go at the data at one time with their own version of how it should be interpreted? Well, uh, with respect to the IGs, they, they, haven't, they haven't gotten involved in the All right. I, 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 I'll accept what you say about the IGs, yeah. but of course and, they are a possible and, layer. And the board has a small staff and OMB has a small staff. We're trying to be as helpful as we can be. So who does that really leave with the responsibility? It, 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 it leaves the recipients themselves are responsible for not only what they put in, but for also checking later to make sure they didn't make any mistakes. And it also leaves the agencies in a position where they have to make darn sure those recipients are, are reporting as accurately as possible. At and the federal at, level or at, at the state level? At, at both levels, quite frankly. I think the federal agencies can only see so much. So as they look down, they're going to have to depend on their state counterparts as well to, to talk to the recipients. And, and as it cascades down, hopefully at the end of the day, a recipient will get a notification that something's wrong and you need to look at that. But the way the OMB guidance is, only recipients can actually change the data. Federal agencies, the board, OMB can't change the data. So the recipients have to be notified that we think there's a mistake and then they have to change the data. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, of course, goes to how long it takes to make sure that it, all of that can it, it occurs. Does, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I recognize that the uh, administration, in fact, I myself, 
was very pleased to have some data to use when the first, was it 30,000 jobs came out, uh, to indicate that this, was, this money was, was certainly producing something. Uh, and, I, and you've been under a lot of pressure uh, to, to show that it's producing something. Now, of course, as is always the case with Congress, when they do oversight, you will continue to be under that pressure and under the same pressure to correct the errors. At least you have the understanding from me that you're doing what has never been done before. Let me ask you about analyzing what's occurred. Um, I think this is pretty organic, that this is one of those things, kind of like the common law, you learn by doing it and you build on it and you, you build a better mousetrap each time or you perfect the mousetrap each time. Um, in addition to OMB, agencies had to provide guidance to recipients to explain the, the requirements. Now we've got the next quarterly reporting period, and that's going to be sometime in January. And each quarter thereafter, uh, the funds are going to continue to be spent. I guess that's the last year of, of the stimulus funding. Um, is there a way in which, as an administration, you are reviewing the first quarter of re reporting and to analyze the problems, then to streamline or improve upon the process in some way that everybody, so that everybody will be doing the same thing? Could you tell us how, uh, what that process looks like, that review process? based on hard data now before you, where you've sorted out what kinds of mistakes were made, I think some of them inevitably made, so that you would then give, I take it, new or revised uh, instructions to whom? And how is that being communicated across the government? Well, uh, certainly everybody involved in this is engaged in a lessons learned exercise. We're all looking, and I, and I would include, and I'm sure the agencies are as well, but OMB and the board are engaged in this lessons learned activity right now. And we, will, we, we have learned a lot from this first reporting period. We've learned a lot from the fine report that GAO put out today as well. And I know that OMB has responded that they're going to implement GAO's recommendations. I suspect the IGs will be involved in making some recommendations as well. And what we hope to do is make each and every reporting period run more smoothly than the last. And there are certainly some technical fixes that the board can do on this next reporting period to make it easier for reporters, re recipients to report. And additional guidance or clarification of guidance by OMB is going to be very helpful as well. And if I yes. uh, may add, Madam Chair, uh, in practical terms, even during this first reporting period, across agencies, we've been trying to make these corrections in real time. We have these twice weekly conference calls that include all the agencies where we're talking about recipient reporting, what we've seen. So these are conference calls these are among all the agencies. Among all the world. agencies. It, we do this uh, twice a week. I have personally found it actually to be very helpful because uh, where do those emanate from? OMB or the, the, recovery board? Uh, the, the recovery office uh, is is actually uh, leading those. But we're finding common issues on recipient reporting. For example, uh, across agencies, we see where we should focus our assistance efforts, uh, the kind of common errors. So uh, I know that. Uh, that, that the recipient reporting will be better in the next quarter. But even getting through this first uh, uh, reporting cycle, some of the things that people have seen, we've been able to do that feedback loop very quickly. Uh, again, you will know best um, from your own feedback and from your own lessons learned how this should be done. My own, I must tell you, my own sense is that in reporting hard numbers, one should should be very careful. Um, I myself would would not use single numbers. I'm not here to tell you how to do it, but people who engage in um, uncertainty every day have learned how to develop ranges uh, so that people do not have raised expectations, and so that people do not play a game of gotcha. And let me tell you something about gotcha. 
we have never had before this uh, committee anything approaching quarterly reports. The way in which the Congress has operated, uh, certainly in the years I was in the minority, is wait until <laughs> um, something is all over. Then the easy thing to do is to call in people and recount the errors that occurred. What this hearing is doing is working with the administration to track what has never been tracked before so that we can get something out of a hearing that is corrective and helpful so that while we are disappointed that the numbers uh, were erroneous, uh, we, we believe that the importance of this hearing is the process you just described. That may be the most important thing that could possibly happen because the kind of error, errors that, that my agency found uh, may be entirely different from that of another agency. And then in the next quarter, I get that kind of error. But nobody forewarned me that that kind of error comes up. So that this sharing, yeah, of errors and of corrections across uh, the boundary lines of agencies, despite their different missions, uh, could not be more helpful. Uh, the, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is to recess this hearing for 15 minutes, let us say, until, what is that, 2 o'clock? Uh, He's the next speaker. Mr. He's not here. We'll recess uh, for uh, un until two o'clock.
working with you in the days and months ahead. Thank you very, very much for your testimony. Thank you, Amen.